Recording in progress. Thank you. Okay. Let's start question one. Um yeah. Jack lives in the world where he can either consume good C or leisure F. So good C. And his utility function is C F equals to alpha ln of C plus beta ln of F. Okay, so we have price of goods, P equals price of goods. And W equals to wage. Notes. Okay. So for this question, A, what is your consumer's budget constraint? Um, so his entire weeks of budget is T hours. So if I use all hours to work. My budget is T times W. So uh, WT. So wage times T, right? And what's what can I do with my time? Um, so I can either le have leisure or I can have labor. So wage of T is equals to wage of leisure plus wage of labor. And whatever I work, this is work, I can use for consumption. Therefore, my budget is WF plus price times C. Okay. So that's A. Any question? Okay, then we move on to B. Write out the utility maximization maximization problem and solve his weekly consumption and leisure using Lagrange maximization. Okay, so we have a utility. It's equals to alpha ln of C plus beta ln of F. Okay, so this is, a, and then subject two, WF plus PC minus WT. Okay, so in the exam, be able to take the root of LN is like super crucial. Um, so make sure you know how to take the root of LN. Okay, so, Let's do first order condition. Uh, get DL DC is equals to A over C subject to which is minus lambda of this whole thing minus T lambda DL DF equals to Beta divided by F minus W lambda. Okay, and then we set them equal to zero. This is the the one the Lagrange that we've been doing for a whole semester. Uh, so set them equals to each other, and then we get.
alpha divided by CP equals lambda. Beta wage and leisure equals to lambda. Okay, so let's find the ratio. Ratio would be the ratio of two divided by the ratio of one. So this is one, this is two. We get alpha divided by CP divided by, oh, no, 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 no. So beta over WF divided by alpha divided by CP, which equals to times CP and alpha, which equals to one. So we get beta divided by alpha times C divided by F times P divided by which equals one. Okay. So this is a ratio of beta and alpha. This is the price and wage. And then this is the cost of, well, quantity of goods and uh, quantity of leisure. So let's isolate them. We get F star equals to beta P over W over C. And we get C equals to, so just whole thing to buy F times alpha W over BP. Okay. So we find that, we plug it into the budget, which is WF plus P times C equals to WT. And let's do F first. So W over B, P, A, W, C, plus P, C equals to W, T. W cancel out. What we get is B, P over alpha. C plus P, C equals to W, T. So we have a P, we have a C, common, common, common multiplier. And what we're left with, did I miss something? No. Okay. What we're left with is beta divided by alpha plus one times CP equals to WT. Mm. Okay, so let's simplify this. We get B over A plus A over A CP B plus A over A star demand well equals to wt divided by p hmm. <laughs> okay that's for consumption Okay, are we good in here?
Yeah. Okay. So um, same thing with the um, F, which is the leisure. Um, if you do the same thing, just plug it in. You will get F. The demand for leisure will equals to TP, no T beta over alpha plus beta. Okay. So this is what you get for the um, demand for consumption and uh, demand for leisure. Okay. Did I lose any? Why do we set it equals one? Uh, because lambda divided by lambda is one. Okay. Doesn't make sense. Yeah, I got because it. Because the so lambda so has to be the same. For right. the condition. Okay. Okay. Because I I I I pretty much just skip a step to find the ratio. Um yeah. So this is like the the fast well the most optimal way. That I can do the question fast. So you just find the ratio of lambda two and lambda one. Um, we'll find the rest. Okay, so that's uh, <laughs> that's question one B. Okay, let's do C. C is pretty interesting. So. Find Jack's labor supply function LW and graph it. Okay, so we know that Jack's labor supply function is whatever Jack is determined to like to rest, to have leisure, right? So your total hours minus the amount of time you do leisure, then it's your labor function, right? So I have a total amount of budget is T. So T minus function of leisure will give us labor function of weight, yeah, okay. So that will get T minus T beta alpha plus beta will be two, one minus beta alpha plus beta over T. And then we can do another step to simplify it. So we get alpha plus beta alpha plus beta, which equals to one minus beta alpha plus beta T. And what we left with is LW equals to alpha, alpha plus beta T. Okay. So since that our decision of leisure does not depend on wage, right? So we cannot find any wage there. Sorry. Sorry, guys. So let's keep going. Um, so that no matter how high your wage is, I'm gonna still consume the fixed amount of leisure. So our labor decision will not depend on wage. Does it make sense? 
this will be our um, labor supply function graph. Any question? I'm waiting. Are you just picking an arbitrary point on the x-axis or the LW no, axis? It's not arbitrary. Right? That's what I did for the this. Right. Well, why not to the left? Why not to the left or to the right? Do you get what I'm saying? Uh, can you repeat that? Like how far it is from the y-axis? You're just like it's just a representation, right? There's not there's no particular reason why you pick that distance from the y-axis to draw the line. Mm, yeah, that's arbitrary. Okay, okay. thank you. Yeah, but this point. Is it's from the function. Yeah, I got it. Okay, cool. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Right, let's move on to uh, question two. Wait, can you scroll back up to one A and one B real quick? One A and one B. Um. This is just, so 1A is just a setup of the budget and B is just solving the utility maximization of the labor decision. Got it, thank you. Yeah. Just go to the graph real quick, yeah. Graph? Thank you. Okay. A lot of this, you, you have to like really explain in the problem set. Like I'm just going through like really fast. Like doesn't mean that's like if you copy whatever I had, like it's hard for grading if you don't explain. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Let's do question two. Okay. So for each, well, for an A, we have I think this question is pretty easy. This is probably the less twisted. Um Okay, so for each firm, write down the mathematical form of uh, of an isoquant and draw this isoquant with L on the horizontal axis and K on the vertical. Okay. From what I see, At the isoquant for the first one should be just like the normal one. And then the second one. So this is what I have. Um, I don't want it should be just like this. So this is L, this is K. Because this is equals to production of Y, this is production of Y. So yeah. That's the isoquam. To B, calculate the marginal product of labor 
and capital of each firm. Okay, so for firm A, marginal product for labor is equals to one half L to the negative one half K to marginal product of capital. Give me one second. Same thing. So uh, at point LK equals to one nine, which firm has a, what's it called? Which firm can increase its production by greater amount when giving an additional unit of labor? So at this point, we just plug it in for the firm A because we know firm B it's gonna be constant of one marginal product of labor. So E and P L a little bit tedious, but so we get Okay, so we got um, three over two and one over six. So firm A will have a higher um, marginal product of labor uh, at 0.19, and firm B will have a higher marginal product of capital at 0.19. Okay. okay, so that's B. Any question on this? No, move on. Okay, for C. Now assume K is fixed in the short run. Okay. What is each firm's short run demand function for labor? Okay, so intuitively, just to like use graph to 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 just like map it, that from B, from A, uh, marginal product of labor. So that's would be L, L, and then this will be production Y. So B will be a straight line because it's always one. Okay, for firm A, will be diminishing. Okay, so um, let me see how this question is. Missing. Okay, so we need to change it into function of L. 
how and why. So for firm A, when capital is fixed at nine, I do. Oh, okay. So from A would be function of Y plus two Y. Okay, so this will be how you graph them. You just plug in that the uh, fix of capital of nine, and then you can find the uh, the labor function. Labor production function. Okay, um, so you should probably explain a little bit more why. Company A is like diminishing and company B is like a linear line. Uh, but other than that, um, just answer the question, make sure. Okay, any question I'll see? Okay, if not, I'll move on to question three. I feel like this recording is not going to be even helpful. I'm scared. Okay, sorry. Uh, let's do question three. So consider following production function y equals to a function of lnk equals to min of L two K. Okay. So I'm the type of person that like just couldn't tell what this means. So I will always like kind of like draw a graph here to see like because we know this is um what's it called? Perfect complement. I don't know what's the ratio between the the labor and cap uh, labor and capital. So I'll just plug it in. So one one, I get a production of one. One two, I got production of one. Two one, I get a production of two. So we know that it's two labor equals to one capital. So did hmm. I do something wrong? Okay, equals to of yeah. uh, I'm sorry Andrew I didn't get what you did there with the uh, with the table at the table yeah you with the one 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 and one one two 
Yeah, I'm just like testing when will the production jump. So production jump when I increase one unit of labor. Okay. Yeah. Because like, like when I increase capital, it didn't jump. So it means that the ratio of labor and capital, it's not one labor and two capital. Does it make sense? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So let's keep going. So I know that it the graph must look like. So if if you if if you still like kind of confused with this table, uh, I think in the beginning of the semester I was like I always like do like few more rows. So, like, you know. Ultimately, you can still get it. Um, so it will look like if it's this label of labor uh, capital, that will be look like this. So this will be two, four, one, two. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So now that's the production function. So A, derive the technical rate of substitution. So technical rate of substitution is similar to marginal rate of substitution, right? Um, from like the two goods. Um, so it's, it means the rate of which one unit of input, like increase of one unit of input, can substitute like substitute for another unit of uh, input. So that's the mar the technical marginal rate of substitution. Well, marginal well, technical rate of substitution. Okay, so there is. Um, sorry, is that number? Isn't that number four? You are at a. It's 3A. Oh, hmm? okay. Because the TR is, oh, it's the same thing. Oh, you're at A. Okay, okay, I got you. I yeah, got you. Yeah, 3A, 3A, 3A. Okay. So, um, this, because this is a per, this is not perfect substitute. This is like a perfect complement. Yeah, perfect complement. Sorry. Oh. Because this isoquant, uh, we don't really have technical rate of substitution because uh, whenever we increase unit of capital, it doesn't mean anything. And when we, add, when we increase a unit of labor, like solely, um, it doesn't change anything. So it's either, yeah. So the technical rate of substitution doesn't exist for, um, maybe it doesn't exist as a too, too much of a strong word. Let me see how I answer it from last year. Give me one second. Okay, I think I remember how I answer it. So when L is increasing at this point, the TRS equals zero. 
when when at this point when you're increasing capital it's actually negative infinity for um technical rate of substitution i don't know if you can see this so trs is equals to negative of marginal product of labor what is the marginal wait Let's see what is confused yeah marginal product of labor over marginal product of capital so at this point it's actually to the infinity so it's a negative infinity and at this point on it's actually zero any increase of labor will be like it, it wouldn't increase like you wouldn't yeah can you explain that again how do I explain this better? Okay, think about this as a slope. So TRS is a slope. So at point from two before words, like I'm not willing to exchange a unit of labor to any amount of capital because I require two worker with one machinery. If you take over one worker, I wouldn't produce anything. No well, matter how much machinery you give it to me, I will not exchange one unit of work. Does it make sense? So in order for you to produce output, we have to have two workers. Anything less than that, no matter how much machinery you have, you're not going to produce any output. Yes. Okay. Because it required two labor and one capital. Right. So at this point forward, what's my exchange rate of labor and capital? It's zero. Right. I wouldn't exchange any machinery for any amount of labor. So if that was less than two, then TRS is zero. Yeah. Okay. I hope that makes sense. Because the slope is it's it's the it's the exchange ratio between one goods and, and another. So in this production side, um firm side, it's just capital and labor. So what about K? Hmm? What about what about K? Capital. Capital? Yeah. Total rate of what's the TRS in terms of capital? Okay, let's look at this. So at this point, how much will I exchange for another unit of capital? How much labor? Zero, right? Like no matter how much labor you give it to me, I will not exchange any. Like I will not exchange for that capital, right? This is a similar concept. Only when you like upgrade it to the next isoquant, what else? Like if you only change one thing, like. Because like labor and capital at that isoquant, it's not substitutable. Like you cannot substitute any labor to capital at that isoquant. Does it make sense? 
No? Yeah, I think I got it. Um, I hope it's clear. I don't know. Okay. So that's the technical rate of substitution. Okay. Let's see if this is a return to scale thing. So is it constant increase or decrease return to scale? Okay. So I I believe you guys learned that uh some K method in class. Um I'm not really proficient in that. So I basically just like do it here. So if I times I mean, I guess you can do K here. So if you times K, what happened to the production? So the production would actually be minimum of 2K. You will get 2K. So this is a constant return to scale. Or you can just say like, try to double it. Um, double it would be four and one. Oh, four and two, and four and two, two times two k is four. So four four is four. So it's exactly twice. So you double your labor and double your capital. It double your output. Output. Let's move on to C. Determine the long run cost function, C, W, R, Y. So this is where R is rent and W is wage. And Y is output. The long run cost function, um, in the long run, Everything is very um, but in this function hmm, I think okay, so your cost function would be rent times capital plus wage times worker. Worker is L. And what's your K and what's your L? So your K must, like this ratio must hold. So your K will equals to Y, your L, well, equals to half y. Therefore, you just plug it in. Your cost function would be in terms of wage and rent and output. Well, equals to r times half. Did I do something wrong in this thing? It doesn't correlate with my other answer key. Give me one second. Rent and capital. What's going on? Mm. One labor, one. So the minimum would be one. One, two, 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 it still be one. Two, one, that will be. Two. This will be two. Okay. 
this is not one. So two labor must equals to one capital must equals to two one. Then this is one. Two Y is equals to two L and two Y equals to one K. Therefore, Y is equals to L and K is equals to two Y. Y is equals to half K. Okay, 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 sorry. Let's just confuse. What did I do wrong? Hmm. Okay, I think it's this part. I shouldn't plug it into that. This is not true. This condition is not true. Minimum is equals to this equals to y. So L equals to 2K equals to Y, L equals to Y, and K equals to half Y. Okay, okay, that, that makes sense. Okay, now we have this cost function in terms of production of Y. Okay, I think that's it. So R one half R plus W over Y. Right. Would the values in the table then change? Value of the table didn't change. It's still, you need two labor and one capital. That one is correct. Oh, yeah. yeah. That one is correct. Uh, it's this part where it gets a little bit funky. Um, One unit of labor equals to two capital equals to Y. Um. I think there's like something like I remember when I was like undergrad, like my professor just told me that just put an equal sign here and then equals to Y. Can anybody like try to explain that? It helps me too. Like, does anyone know why? This will give you two Y. If I plug it in, it will be inverted. If it's inverted, it's wrong. Okay, let me think about that later because I can't come up with anything on the, the time constraint. Um, but this is your cost function for C. Yeah. 
So cost function, it's basically just replace your, uh, so this is your cost, uh, rent times capital and wage times labor. And then you just replace your capital and labor function into it in terms of Y. And then you get your cost function with wage R and Y. Okay, let's do D. Let me think about like question C for a little bit. And then um, maybe I will post something because I, it's just, a, it's a trick, but I never really get to know why. It's always like, um, I don't have time to solve this. I'll just do it. Um, okay, I'll, 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 I'll leave it. And then like, if I solve it on time on Monday, I'll, I'll post a notes or something and explain why this is the case. Um, okay, let's do D. Suppose the market price output is P. So P is price. And solve for the firm's long-term profit maximization problem. So use the cost function above. Okay, so we have a total cost function on the top would be, so total cost would be, let me just do this, cost of Y equals to R over two plus W times Y. Um, so that's our total cost function and we have a price. So we know that marginal cost must equals to marginal revenue equals to price. So our profit maximization would be P is equals to uh, C of Y and P C of Y, C of Y would be taking the derivative of this total cost function respect to unit of production. Well, I mean, to the production of the goods. So that would be R divided by two plus W. So that's your profit maximization. Your price must equals to rent divided by two plus wage. Okay. Why did we say on this revenue? marginal cost equals marginal revenue and P? Sorry. Uh, why did we just think the derivative with respect to Y? You just say, huh? I'm sorry. Why did we take the derivative with respect to Y? Uh, because Y is your your production. It's a unit of production, right? So what's your what's your profit? I think Y was output. So uh, so your profit would be P times Y, right? Right. So marginal revenue, well, not like not profit, revenue, sorry. <laughs> hmm. I'm a little bit tired. So revenue. Revenue is equals to P times Y. And it's given the price P. So therefore, marginal revenue must equals to marginal cost. So if my marginal revenue is P, then my marginal cost must take, well, I mean, taking the derivative, you have to take the derivative with respect to Y because that's your production. Does it make, make, make sense? Yeah, I got it, I got it. I feel like I'm not explaining enough, um, but yeah. Maybe it's just like lack of experience in teaching. No, you're good. You're good. You're good. You're good. Mm. Yeah, does it make, make sense why like marginal cost equals marginal revenue equals P? Yep. Okay. 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 I'm scared. Um, okay.
All right, we get the point and then let's move on to question four. So we have a production function of x1 and x2. Draw an isoquant, directly calculate the technical rate of substitution at any point of any input. Verify this is the same as, okay. So um, TRS is equals to uh, negative of m p one over m p two. This is a production function of two vis, right? Okay. Oh, I need to draw it. So if you draw it, I probably look like this. Because um, it's like kind of like something couple of Douglas, um, and TRS. Directly calculate the technical rate of substitution at any point of input level x1 x2 and it's the same as that how do i do that let me check my how i did it years ago oh. Okay, um, so I basically just take the derivative. Um, so dy dx1 dx2 is equals to x1 dx2 dx1. So I take the total derivative of um, both function respect to uh, goods one and goods two. Get X one. dx1 plus x2 dx2. And then you set them equals to zero. So x1. dx1 is equals to um, negative x2 dx2. And we can find dx2 over dx1 will equals to negative of x2 over x1. And let's check to see, taking the total derivative, would that be equals to um, negative marginal product of one and marginal product of two? So marginal product of one is negative x2 over x1. Yeah, they're the same. If you ask me why I take total derivative, I 
I don't know. Can anyone tell me why I take the total derivative? It's so bizarre. I'm losing it. Um. Yeah, why did I take total derivative? Okay, so if I take total derivative of the function, I'll get the slope. Okay, that's why you take the total derivative. Okay, okay, okay. Makes sense, makes sense, makes sense. Okay, uh, anyone has a question on this? On how to take the total derivative? That's an awkward silence of me not doing a good job. Oh, that makes sense. Makes sense? Who's that? Yep. Is that Jesse? Jesse. Oh, Jesse. Nope, okay. Jesse. Hey. Jesse. Okay, could you explain? Like, could you like just briefly explain what like why 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 this is the case? Like, like I mean, because you understand. Um well, if you take the total derivative, then you're taking both of the movements from the first position to the second position into account, are you not? As opposed to isolating the movement with just one variable, like the partial movement. Awesome. Okay. Thank you so much, Jesse. Um, okay. I don't know if that's right, but I, that's as far as I get. Yes, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. That's that's exactly how I did it. Um, I don't know what the answer key says, but um, but yeah, I I I think at that time, I think it makes sense. It's just like years later, I just like completely forgot everything because it's like not used for a while. Um, so I have a question. Yes. So we're taking the total derivative so we can track the, the changes in both x and y, right? Yes. All right. Yeah. So it's like change along this line. It's like, like, yeah, like that's when you take the total derivative. I remember that that the um, the tech professor was teaching us like the total derivative um and that's how you find the um, the movement um i think because of that and i kind of like don't remember anything in tech mm. okay so let's move on to this awkward um conversation about a let's do b so solve the long run cost minimization problem to get C Y. C Y. Okay. So let's do the setup. Min of X one and X two. You have a budget. Is this one part of the budget? Cost minimization. So that will be cost of x1. Uh, let's not use c. Use p. One x1 plus p2 of x2. Cost minimization, subject to y equals to x1 and x2. So set up this Lagrange will be equals to p1x1 plus p2x2 minus lambda of x1, x2 minus y. And the L, the x1, the P, 
one minus x two lambda dl dx two equals to p two minus x one lambda root seven equals zero, and then you get just so let me go here. Okay, so you get p one over x two equals to lambda one. You get p two over x one equals to lambda two, and you try to find the ratio of lambda two over lambda one equals one equals to p two divided by x one over p one over x two, so which is equals to p two times x2 p1 so we get 1 equals to p2 x2 over p1 x1 okay let's find the ratio so x1 so divide multiply you get x1 equals to p2 p1 x2 x2 equals to so you just multiply this one x1 divided by p2 okay so that's your um ratio okay so I did the cost minimization and I need to get to C of Y. Okay. So C of Y is equals to, it's a function of rent. Well, not rent, price of one, price of two and production, which is equals to P1 X1 plus P2 X2 hmm. is the outcomes. It is the cost. Price of producing a goods one and price of producing goods two. The cost. Okay. So let's plug it in. C of Y equals to price of one. All right. Let me think a little bit. Y is constant. Long run cost minimization, Y is constant. Give me one second. Didn't plug in Y. Ignore that for now. Um, let me just plug in Y. <clears throat> so Y is equals to X1 and X2. That's our production. Let's plug in X1, P2, P1, X2, multiply by X2 equals to Y. P2, 
three over P one X two square plus four. X two square equals to Y multiplied by the opposite P one and P two. We get X two is equals to Y P one over P two square root. Be so probably not do that. Okay. So x one mm. oh, oh let me find this expansion. So I plug in the x1. Now I plug in x2. So x1 over p2 equals 1. Uh, deduction for x1 would be Multiply, divide, P2 over P1, square root. Okay. Oof. Um, okay, so this is the, the, the decision of supply how many quality of X2 and decision of supply how much quality of X1. Um, Mm, this is so abstract. Okay, and then now we put in both into our cost function, which is cost function of um, P1, P2, and Y. We get P1 X1 plus P2 X2. So cost of production of X1 and cost of production X2. And then the decision of how many quality of X1 this company will produce and decision of how many quality of X2 this company will produce. Okay. So P1, X1 is yuck. This is so ugly. Okay, can I simplify this? Yes, I can. Um, P1 I don't just like P1 squared, like P <laughs> plus P two P one Y. Okay. Let me check check my my key from last year before I do anything wrong. Okay, okay, okay. I didn't do it wrong. Okay. So it goes to two. Ah. Uh -huh. The cost function is. Like, P1, P2, Y. So that's our um, total cost function for um, the given production function and the cost minimization. Okay, so any question on this? Okay, so to recap, um, so 
for B, we do the cost minimization. So this is the cost of production of goods one and goods two and subject to the decision of production. And we find the ratio of how many goods one will produce compared to goods two. And we'll, we find the ratio of how many goods two um, in terms of goods one. And then we plug back in into our production function. And then we found this two term. So X1 and X2 in terms of the total production and then the price ratio to one or one, two. And when we find that, we can get our total cost function, which is two square root of P1, P2, and Y. Okay. Any question on that? I feel like I'm still not explaining it enough, but any question? It's making sense. <laughs> it does? Yes. Would you give us something like this on exam? Yes, it will. It oh, will no. definitely will. <laughs> <laughs> this, the, the, the sequence is making sense. Like, it's just the mechanical, like, of it. Like, it's just like, you have to realize that like at some point you need to plug into something and then you need to plug into another thing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like this will be on the exam for sure. Um, yep. Okay, let's move on, not be too sad, uh, go to C. Um, I mean, the, the, the be best way to, 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 to get, get good at this problem is to like practice it several times on yourself, like with different, different problem as well. Um, and when you get used to it, um, it's just very mechanical. I'm sorry. I hate I I hate that I can't give you something that is more intuitive. Yeah, I hate that part. I'm sorry. That's the limitation of education of mine. Um okay. Let's move on to C. What is the marginal cost function? Based on the cost and the marginal cost function, what can you say about this production function return to scale? Okay, so marginal cost. So marginal cost is basically taking the derivative of total cost function. So it's taking the derivative with respect to y. Okay. So we have two p1, p2, and a square root of y. So we're taking that, oh, I mean, I mean, taking the root of that, um, it's just one half to P1, P2. So this become negative. So divided by Y. So cancel out. What you get is marginal cost equals to square root of P1, P2 over square root of Y. No, we just hmm? go over how you simplified the previous question. So when you went from P1 times square root of Y, P2 to P1, how did you go from that to P1, P2, Y, the one single square root? Oh, you mean this? No, I'm talking about the one above. This? Yeah, yeah. How did you go from P1 square root of Y, P2 plus P1? Okay. okay. So because they have the common root interior thing, you can assume that this is like one, one, when you add them, it's kind of like, you know, like you just add one, one, because they have the common root thing, right? So it's kind of like square root of two plus square root of two equals one. It's 
to square root of two, right? That okay, I think I understand. Okay. okay. I mean, you can break it up. Like, uh, if, if if you break it up, it will be just two square root of p one. Ah, uh, let me not do that. Okay, that that clarify it clarifies it or no? Um, my question um in yeah. about that same part at the MC where mm -hmm. it's it's a part, but um you have the square root of y by itself and not with it. Oh, since okay. it's supposed to be two, also. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so it it so it's basically two times square root of p one times square root of p two times square root of y. So this whole thing is equals to two square root of p one p two y. Does it make sense? Oh, you're not. Oh, so the two is times everything and not just the square root of P1, P2. Yeah. So like two. Oh, because yeah. when it, yeah. When it yeah. separates, it kind of look like it's just times that. But no, I see what you're saying. So yeah, why yeah. does, why does uh, the square root of Y end up in the denominator? Oh, uh, because you take a derivative with respect to Y. Got it. Right. So your Y square root is equals to Y to the one half. So you take the derivative, so one negative half, one half, half, negative one half, and this is become negative one half. Yes. Yeah. All right. Okay. I skip a few steps here and there. Good question. Good question. Um, okay. Okay. So that's part C. Did I answer all the question on C? This is so long. Why does two go away? Oh, because the half and two cancel out. Oh, okay. Right? You take the derivative, the one half goes down. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Give me one second to warm up on D. Number four is so long. Um. Now consider short run. Assume X2 is fixed at some level of F. Yes. Derive the cost function and marginal cost function. Okay. Let me cheat. <laughs> so I... wait, question. Um, uh, for C, what would be the return to scale? Return to scale. Oh, I didn't answer that. Um. Give me one second. Oh, okay. Sorry, let me just receive my answer. Okay, okay, okay. So let's do this. So um, what does the increase return to scale graph look like? I confused myself. Sorry. So this is the total cost of production, and then this is unit of production. Okay. So um what's constant return to scale? Like what would be on the graph on this? particular one in terms of total cost and y like and and um well this y is x1 x2 like what would be constant returns to scale looks like i think it's a line going to the upper right yeah, yeah. from the origin okay. correct 
What about decrease return to scale? Bending downward to the right, like a downward parabola on the. Wait one second. Yep. And then the. In so uh uh, let me just try on different color, so I don't get confused. Ah. This is not total cost, it's marginal cost. Okay. So um <laughs> so obviously the blue line it's increased return to oh well, I mean constant return to scale, constant return to scale. Uh and the green line would be what? Like the green. Increase IRS. Yep. Increase return. Right? Because our marginal cost, every unit of cost increase exponentially, right? So that's decrease return to scale. The more we produce, the more it costs. Right? This is a production, and that's a cost function. Yeah, I got it backwards. That's right. right. Okay, so that's the the decrease return, and then this is the increase return because the more we produce, the cheaper it get. Right, so we can increase our production. Okay, so let's look at our marginal costs here. So is that is that an increase or a decrease? So uh because of y is in the bottom. So the more y, so as y reach to infinity, what happened to our marginal cost? It continues to increase. It does. It's, it's, it's in the well. Wait, what's uh -huh. the top? oh? Is it the number? I'm looking at the graph. Sorry, as y gets uh infinitely larger, it gets smaller. Right. So so though as y as more we produce, the our marginal cost actually decrease infinitely, right? Well, I mean not decrease, but but like it, like every unit of production actually lowers like close to zero, right? So that's um increase your return to scale. Because at some point, this probably looks like, I honestly don't know what this marginal cost looks like. It probably looks like this. I'll probably draw the wrong graph. I'm sorry. I feel like I'm like misleading you guys. Like, uh... Okay, let me stop drawing. Okay. um, Don't use this graph um, because I'm probably wrong. But you get the point. Um, so marginal cost is basically unit of cost. As y increase to infinity, um, the more unit you produce, um, the more the the, the 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 marginal cost actually reach to like close to like zero or something like this. Okay, so we're done with C. Any question? I feel like this, like I'm like treating this like hot potato, like. But please ask me a question. 
it helps me too. So it's decreasing, right? No, it's increasing oh, expensive it's scale. It's increasing? Because yeah, it's the cost is decreasing. Oh, cost decreasing, okay. Yeah, as more unit of uh, goods you produce. Uh, Can you it's just explain that one more time? Because I'm just going to add random numbers. Uh, I'm sorry? Can you just explain that one more time? How it's increasing with this scale? Um, <laughs> okay, I'm going to try. So this line, so initial unit of y, it actually costs us a lot to produce. And then as y increases to infinity, our more like every unit of production actually lowers. So it's increasing return to scale. Right. So constant return to scale is probably something not like that. So I can say the more you produce, the less it costs. Basically. One second. I'm sorry. I'm trying to think what would be decrease in return to scale looks like. It's probably like this. Like, am I crazy? Oh, <laughs> constant return skills. It's 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 horizontal. It's horizontal. Sorry. I am having a little bit like weird. Okay, so this is the exact graph. So if you have a constant return scale, your marginal cost is um it's vertical. Oh no, 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 horizontal. And if you have a increased return to scale, it's going down, and then you know you can produce more as you increase. Uh, if you are um decreased return to scale, yours is probably somewhere up here, like whatever. Yeah, but Whatever it's up there, it's increased return to scale. Uh, whatever it's down here, it's decreased return to scale. Okay. Does my drawing make sense, Muhammad? Yeah, that makes sense. Right. I'm sorry. I. I tried. I tried. Um. Okay. Let's go to D. Wow, we're we're gonna take exactly two hour. Hmm. Okay, let's go D. Um. Now consider a short run and consume x two is fixed at some level of f derive the cost function and the marginal cost function. So um, treat X2 is like probably capital. It's fixed at some level of fix, whatever. So now we have, let me just copy whatever is left from our cost function. Okay. And so I'm just gonna copy this. I'm gonna copy this whole thing. Okay, um, so let's treat x2 fix as some level of f. So we'll have cost function of p1x1 plus p2f. Okay, so that's the cost function. So we basically plug it into the x1, which is, I'm just gonna steal everything that I've written before. So right here. And then plus P to F because it's fixed. So that's our cost function. And give me one second. Let me check my bias with my answer. Okay, 
So this will be equals to, so take it to really respect to y, we'll get, <laughs> let me not take that fast. Let me simplify a little bit. It's too ugly. P1, oh, 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 so this whole thing simplified to um, square root of P1, P2, and y plus P2 and f. So we take a derivative with respect to y, c of y, marginal cost will equals to half, p1, p2, over square root of y. That's it. So our marginal cost, yeah, that's it. Double check. Mm -hmm. Oh no, I did it wrong. Oh, this is so wrong. Okay. Okay. All right, x1, x2. So x2 is fixed. I should be taking the f right here. So if we have a f, our production actually change a lot. So um, I don't think we need to run the cost minimization, but um, the y e x1 we equals to f yeah okay. so let's do a cost minimization with this function in mind so we have p1 x1 plus p2 x2 minimization of x1 and x2 and then subject to x1, f minus y. Because y uh, x2 is fixed uh, on, the, on the decision of production. So we have a Lagrange. Sorry, I did so wrong. T1. And then we got minus f lambda dl dx2. We get p2 over nothing. p2 equals 0. So let's set this equals to each other. So lambda it's equals to p1 divided by f. Okay, so this is lambda. And that is our marginal cost. For x1. Okay. And our cost function would be W, not W, P1, Y divided by F, 
Was? Because our x1 and f equals to y. x1 is equals to y divided by f. So we have the ratio right here. So we can just plug it directly into our cost function. And then we have our cost function and our marginal cost. will be P1 over F. Mm. Okay. Did anyone get, get that? It's kind of like number three, so I'm kind of understanding. Um? Kind of like number, it's kind of like the root here, number three. Yeah, yeah. So I'm kind of making a sense sense of it from that perspective. Like when we took the, the three for a three C and B. So it's familiar. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I think I treat X1 and X2 as like some production of like for example like Kobo and labor like, but anyway like price of one and price of two still makes sense <laughs> okay yeah this is a little bit trippy okay let's do e Unless we are, unless we may anybody anybody have a question on D? Wait, how do you um, how do you set P two to, to lambda? Because when I look at the restraint, there's no x two term. Don't worry, this. No. This you don't even need to take the minimization. Because I, I did it in the halfway, and then I realized that like. It doesn't really give you anything. The only thing you need, because it's fixed already. So y equals to x1 and f, right? So my x1 production decision is equals to the total production. Oh no, I mean x1 not production, but like the quantity I need for x1, it's the 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 production, like the total production divided by f. And then we just plug this into our budget. Well, oh, yeah, I see. Yeah, our budget is basically P1, X1, plus P2, F. And then we just plug this in. And we get the our cost function. And then we can take the derivative and we get um, marginal cost function. So ignore the whole minimization or Lagrange that I try to do. It doesn't work. Okay. We good on D? Okay, let's move on. E. In what way is this marginal cost function fundamentally different from typical assumed short-run marginal cost function? Fundamentally different. Um, Why is this marginal cost? Because we know the the x2 is fixed. If that's fixed, I can only increase and decrease of my x1. 
But that depends on the price of goods one and the quantity of X2. What does that mean? What does that mean? I think this is just the normal marginal cost function. Sure, a marginal cost function. But give give me give me a second. Let me see my explanation. Oh, okay. Okay, okay, okay. So the price of, oh, so marginal cost. So when we increase X1, our marginal cost of the whole production actually didn't change because F is fixed and P1, it's fixed. So like think about X1 as maybe labor and X2 is capital, right? So when we're trying to increase X1, the marginal cost, it's, it's the same, it's constant. So that means that like our short run, our marginal cost doesn't increase. It's the same. So the typical marginal cost function. So when you are holding the capital fix, you want to hire more worker. The marginal cost would definitely increase, right? So think about like, like you are working, well, not like you are working, but you open an ice cream store and then like your machinery is fixed and then you add in more worker. The marginal cost didn't change. And your production didn't change. Well, I mean, didn't decrease, right? So if you increase one unit of X1, it's increased in the ratio of your machinery. So like your, your, your kitchen actually is not that, like it, it's not the typical crowded that you cannot produce more quantity of Y. You actually can produce the same, well, not like, I mean, additional unit of labor you can create F amount of output. So in that case, um, your marginal cost didn't change. And your production is, when you increase one unit, it's increase F units of output. Does it make sense? I lose anyone on that explanation on E. Wait, is everyone still here? Okay. Any question? On e? Can you explain it one more time? Okay. Um I, I, I'm I'm more explaining this like using like scenario, right? So when we're oh I mean what well, well, everyone is in undergrad learning like micro macro. Well, we talk about this like okay, so labor with the worker and also the ice cream shop, right? So your capital is your machine to produce those ice cream and the worker is the amount of worker that you hire. So the typical um, 
situation when machinery is fixed. Because in the short term, there's no way you can buy a huge ice cream machine because that takes time to to like other people will produce that machine, right? So like in the short term, they, there's no way you can get another machine in the short run. You can hire more workers, right? But the, the, the typical situation we learn is that when we adding more worker, our production slows down. The cost increase, the marginal cost increase. So every unit of ice cream, it costs you more to produce because you hire one more extra unit of worker. Does it make sense? So that's that's the typical scenario. Okay. Yeah, but in this scenario, we get our answer of marginal cost. It only de depends on P1 and F, which is the cost of labor divided by number of machinery, right? So when we look at this production function, when we increase one unit of X1, so if I increase, this is like X1 star, when we increase, our production output actually increased by F, right? So our production didn't slow down because of this crowded kitchen. Like adding one more unit of labor in that small, tiny ice cream shop will create, like, for example, if we have like four, for ice cream machine, we create four four more ice cream. Like if you add one more um, labor, which doesn't make sense, but yeah, um, does it make sense? Yeah, to some extent, because I was thinking about it could be like a diminishing return after a certain point, but I guess no. In this one, it doesn't have. Right. So in order for you to have a diminishing return, what do you need to have? It's when you increase worker, you start to producing less. Mm -hmm. Right. You become less productive. But in this <laughs> case, no, you don't. You don't become less productive. Right. And in okay. our cost function, if our P1 is equals to X1 uh, to the square or whatever. So P1 is a function of like, x1 then we'll have problem with high hiring additional unit of labor because the more we hire the more the labor is going to cost the additional unit of labor is going to cost for example if you imagine yourself as, as like a tech startup so there's like really scarce resources of um quality labor Right, so the the people who can code or whatever, so the Facebook and like uh Microsoft, they just like hire the worker, no matter what cost, because they want their competitor to not get that worker because it's so scarce in computer science. Well, I mean hypothetically, well, I mean it is the case. That's why they have like a lot of like, um, yeah, anyway. Uh, but yeah, like like the, the the labor market is scarce, so mm -hmm. like the additional unit of labor you hire, it actually costs you more than the previous labor you hire. But that it's not our problem. In our cost function, that's not the case. So we don't have this decrease in productivity, and we don't have this increase in additional unit of cost of labor. So therefore, we don't have diminishing marginal return on labor. Okay. 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 Sorry. This is a hard question. Okay. We good on E? Yeah, thank you. Good. Okay, let's do F. Let's consider uh decrease returns to scale. F of X. 
So we know this is decreased return to scale because alpha and beta, they add up to less than one. Um, okay. Again, suppose in the short run X2 is fixed at some level of F, find the firm's short run supply function and draw it. Okay. So this is a classic scenario where your production actually decrease where you actually where you increase additional unit of labor. So we when we when we said that we 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 see x1 as uh labor and x2 is capital, right? So in this case, we actually experience this decrease in productivity when we increase one unit of labor. Right? So our marginal product of labor is equals to one half of x one to the negative one half, right? Well, I, 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 fine. I'll just draw this. But uh, okay, so let me just simplify this in a bit. So one half uh, over x two to the one third. We said this is capital capital. And then we said this is labor, right? So marginal product of labor. So when we increase in labor, what happened to our marginal product of labor? Anyone? Volunteer? Yes, small. Yep. So a decrease, right? So it, 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 it go extremely tiny to some point where infinity is close to zero, right? So what does it mean when we have marginal product of labor equals zero? It means that additional unit of labor that you put in, it gives you zero production. So in this case, uh, your firm's short run supply function Mm. Oh, I'm like skipping, but um, you want a second? Let me see what I did last year. Ah, oh. I got it wrong. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I mean, you can find the, the short run supply function, right? So what's the short run supply function? Short run supply function. Short run supply is Y is your supply. It depends on your price of one and price of two and quantity of one and quantity of two. So your supply function looks like Supply is price and what? Ah. 
Short run supply. Yeah, let me resume my steps. Amazing. Yeah. Y equals to X one, one half, F two to one third. So our short run supply would be Y equals to X one, F. Oh, why am I rewriting this? So X one equals to y divided by f to the one third so x1 multiplied by well, I mean you square root them and the cost function equals to t1 x1 will be equals to y squared f to the two third plus t2 f How can we maximize? Which one we maximize it using marginal cost equals to P. So total cost is equals to no, that's not true. Hmm. Okay, let's find MC first. Marginal cost equals to that become fixed. So marginal cost is P1 over F to the two third times two of Y. It must equals to P. Oh, that's it. Okay. That's your supply. That lose anyone? Okay. And you draw it. So we have a price and we have a Y. Um, so let's draw it. What does it look like? So uh, when we increase in Y, we increase price. So hmm? I think it's just linear, right? Am I crazy? Yeah, it's linear. 
from? Where did you get? Where does the two Y come from? Why is it being multiplied by two times Y? Huh? Why is it being multiplied by two times Y? Oh, oh taking the derivative. Oh, okay. So marginal cost, it's uh total cost taking the derivative respect to Y. And the marginal cost is the supply curve that we're looking for? Is that yeah, because we we set marginal cost equals to price. Uh -huh. So price, um, like supply curve, it determines by the market price of the ice cream and the quality of ice cream, right? So when we find the marginal cost, the marginal cost is the supply curve. If you are profit maximization. Or cost minimization. Like if you're a company that search for profit, you should like your marginal cost will equals to price, market price. Okay, yeah. So in this case of um oh, let me see the previous one. This thing. Marginal cost is equals P1 and F. Let's look at we'll look at it. So marginal cost equals to P1 and F equals to P. So in this case, this is constant. So it looks like this. Wait, does it look like this? Give me a second. Am I crazy? Yeah, it does. Um, yeah, this is constant. Okay, yeah. So uh, in the previous, well, I mean, not previous question, but in the same question where we have this like weird um, supply function, which is um, D, D, C, and A, they're together. Um, our marginal cost function, I, I, actually it's, um, it's horizontal, it's constant. So every unit we produce, it's actually uh, increase, increase return to scale problem. Increase the return to scale because as long as the market price is higher, so P, as long as the market price is higher than my supply, I'll produce infinite. Make sense? Yeah. This is the hardest problem set, I think. I don't think you have anything harder than this, except the final exam. Is this the last problem set? Let me see. Wait, there's problem set six. Oh, oh problem set six, it's, it's not bad. Oh, so it's actually better. Okay. Yeah, this is the hardest problem set you'll have. Um, well, any question? No, stop the recording. <laughs>